you're at 250 on Apple. Uh, June's at 150. What gives you the confidence that Apple continues to go higher? How much of it has to do with services? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. And I would argue that uh, you know the upside is almost close to 20% or price target, which is a pretty good upside for a mega cap stock. Um, clearly, services is a, a big piece of the pie when you look forward to the upside to the stock. You know, the first thing I want to highlight is that the weakness in the iPhone units for this year is very well telegraphed. You know, everyone has units down maybe 10, 15 percent or so. So I don't think there's going to be any much negative surprise on that side. The positive surprise would come from services, and uh, it'll be very interesting to see how they price the TV Plus offering over the next few months, because I do think that would be a very uh, important catalyst for the name. Yeah, you're right. You're right. 20 percent is quite a bit. June, you said on July 31st that you expect Apple to guide down uh, in Q4, I believe. Uh, the day after that, the president announced these tariffs that made things look bad. Since then, the president has pulled back on those tariffs. Does any of that affect your expectation? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the two reasons we uh, we downgrade Apple, uh, one is uh, we expect um, Apple will, will, will cut uh, their production uh, for the uh, for the December quarter uh, because of continued weakness uh, in the iPhone sales. Uh, the second, uh, we believe Apple um, lag behind the 5G cycle. Um, so uh, when we look at next year, uh, the China going to be the largest 5G market, and we believe Apple. We'll continue losing shares in China. So um, I don't think Apple 5G story uh, will be uh, heading next year. So I think a tariff, uh, in terms of the tariff, we don't think uh, Apple, uh, the reason we downgrade Apple is because of tariff, uh, the change in the tariff. So I, I don't think it's, it's a matter too much um, for, our, uh, for our business. So we, we continue to believe that uh, even with, uh, without a tariff, um, Apple, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the iPhone sell through will continue to be weak. And uh, if, if the tariff increase, uh, that would uh, put the more headwinds uh, for the iPhone sales. Krish, a lot of focus on this uh, upcoming Apple TV Plus launch in the fall um, and getting reports now that there's been a big boost to content spending, $6 billion. How much should Apple be spending on content if the company really wants to make a meaningful push into this arena? Um, yeah, I mean, clearly the numbers are in the billions of dollars, right? The, the question is that what magnitude are we talking about? There were press reports about $6 billion. We did an analysis today where we came up with about $2.8 uh, But we also done, uh, like, a staggered matrix approach based on how much they need to spend. And, uh, you know, you can even think of, like, Netflix kind of numbers, like running close to $15 billion. The real question at that point is that, you know, uh, what is the big opportunity cost for them? How many subs are you going to get? I think as the cost goes higher, the break-even level for that business also goes higher as you get. You need more subs to basically break even. But the bottom line is that uh, content costs are going up. But at the end of the day, consumers are willing to adopt or pay if the content is interesting from their vantage point. And therefore, you know, we have it at 2.8 billion. But can they reach the Netflix level of 15 billion? I think it is possible. Hey, June, I know um, they get mentioned uh, today in this journal piece on the softer pace of buybacks. I mean, we, we realize their cash position is huge, but is there any tie between uh, buying back fewer shares than you did a year ago or a quarter ago and the projections for the money they're going to have to spend on content in the future? Uh, yeah, I think uh, looking at the, uh, the Apple TV, I think uh, so far their installation base is very small. So I, I think they're trying to monetize, um, you know, continue to grow Apple TV and trying to monetize that, uh, that user base. Um, so I think it, it, it's going to take, a, take multiple years for them to increase the TV installation base um, and also spend, uh, you know, uh, more money to, to the, uh, on the content side. Uh, for the buyback, uh, yeah. I think uh, they, have a, they still have a huge cash right now, so I think they probably will continue to buy back. Um, I think there will be a little bit better between the investment in the content and also the cash buyback. And finally, Krish, uh, June makes an interesting point when it comes to 5G. We had Gene Munster on yesterday. He said that he thinks that while the holiday season this year for the iPhone will be good, right after that, people are going to start thinking about 5G coming the next year, and iPhone sales could be really disappointing. Why isn't he right? 
So, yeah, I mean, at this point, the expectation is that the 5G phone is going to come sometime next year. I would also argue that, you know, if you look at the cadence of Apple's phone releases, it happens around October time frame. And October is actually fiscal year 21 for Apple, not fiscal 20. So realistically, it's not a FY20 upside for Apple with the 5G cycle. It's going to be more FY21 and realistically into calendar 21. So that's one thing I would say. The other part of the equation is that, you know, we're still very early in the 5G cycle, especially in the U.S. You know, if, if you own an iPhone and I come and tell you that, you know, a 5G phone is going to be delayed by nine months to 12 months, chances are of the consumer switching over to Android is actually de minimis, I would say. So I think there's a little right. bit of stickiness in the U.S. So I don't see 5G delay as a big risk.